Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Lifting the Fog, a program designed to remove the misconceptions, misunderstandings, and misrepresentations about Islam and what it contains. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next part of our segment in this series, we would like to deal with the subject of the Quran and previous revelations. One of the things that comes to us, many times we receive questions from people, emails, etc., and they'll ask us, how come Muslims don't believe in the Bible, yet it says in their book, meaning the Quran, that the Bible was from Allah? Or how come the Muslims want to debate with us about our book at the same time they're supposed to believe in it? Well, that's a pretty good question. Others will say, well, didn't Muhammad, peace be upon him, really just find an old copy of the Bible and he just copied it? Another good question. Did Muhammad come up with something brand new and just claim that it was from God and try to imitate some of the things that he heard about the Bible? It's a fair question. Why don't Muslims just accept the Bible? Why do you have to have a Quran? All of these questions, I think, are answered in our minds a lot easier when we translate the understanding rather than just a word. To begin with, the word Quran actually has a meaning, and we need to go to the source to find out what it is in the Arabic language. The root for this is Qara'a. Qara'a. And Quran actually has the meaning of something in recitation. One who recites is called a Qari. And when you order someone to recite, you say to them, Iqara. And when it is being recited, it is called Quran. So all of this has to do with recitation. Again, when we go to the translations, one of the things that we've talked about in lifting this fog of misunderstanding is to talk about a better way to understand these words. The word here can be translated, Quran, as something to read, as in to stand before some group and recite to them or give a reading. But specifically to call it that which is read, meaning that you're standing there holding a book and looking at it, communicates a, a, a misconception. Because the Quran is not a physical book that you hold in your hand. It's a recitation. The Quran can be in written form, and then you have something that you can look at and use. But in this concept, it would be similar to your money. When you have a dollar bill, it doesn't really have a wealth. It represents the wealth that's somewhere else. Let me give you an example. A one-pound note and a five-pound note and a ten-pound note or a one-dollar bill, a five-dollar bill, and a ten-dollar bill. They're not really money. They represent gold or silver or some type of wealth that's somewhere else. In the same way, the Quran, when we see something written down and we say, this is the Quran, we have to understand that that itself is not Quran, but represents the Quran. The Quran is in the book which is with Allah. And this really does help us to have a better concept of what we're talking about. Now let's look at the other word, Bible. The word Bible comes from the Kone Greek word, biblios. Biblios simply means a book. It's as simple as that. So the word Bible means book. And it's referred to in the Quran. In the Arabic language, you would say Bible or biblios by saying kitab. And that's exactly what Allah calls the revelations when they're written down. Kitab Allah. The original Bible, that which came with Moses, when it was written down, put in a book form, could easily be called a Bible or a book. The same when it came to the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, it was called a kitab or a book. So in the Quran, Allah speaks about the book the revelation that came before. The plural of book is kutub. And it says in the Quran that Muslims need to believe in the 
and believe in Allah, His angels, and His books. Kutubihi, Allah's books. So as Muslims, we must believe in all the revelation that came, whether it came with Abraham, or Moses, or David, or Suleiman. We believe in it. What came with Jesus, we believe in it. What comes with Muhammad, we believe in it. But what is it that we believe? One of the things that we notice, especially with a program like this, we're talking about lifting the fog, removing confusion, we have to understand that when we translate something, it's not the same anymore. In fact, that's what the word translate means. It means to change something. So obviously it's not as it was. Whenever the Quran is interpreted into the English language, it loses a lot right away. It doesn't convey exactly the same meaning. By the way, the same would be true for the Bible. The things that we know from the Bible in the original language, by the way, which happened to have been Hebrew or Aramaic, certainly wouldn't be the same thing if it was translated into the Koine Greek. And then after that, it was translated to Latin. Again, it wouldn't be the same thing even as the Koine Greek. If you then take that and translate it to English, would it be the same? According to the Quran, the answer would be no. Because the Quran tells us that the Quran can't be duplicated. It cannot be replicated in any form or format. This means then, if I translate Quran to English, it's not the Quran anymore. It is only the meaning of some of the words. And even those are going to change. The concept of words and understandings are constantly being updated. You see new editions of the dictionary, encyclopedia all the time, simply because of that. Let us now look to the word Quran one more time and realize that it is recitation. Allah promises to preserve the Quran or recitation until the last day. What does that mean? That means we should be able to hear it. Not necessarily read it or look at it as a book, but to be able to hear it. And is that true? Well, as a matter of fact, I personally have been all around the world to many, many countries. And I have observed that this same exact recitation or Quran is being recited in all of these countries. In Indonesia and in Saudi Arabia, in India and in Pakistan, in Egypt and Morocco, in Turkey. These are Muslim countries all having the exact same recitation of the Quran. But did you know that's the same one also in non-Muslim countries? Sweden, Denmark, Ireland, England, Germany, France, and guess what? Even in America, it's the same exact recitation. Not a jot, not a dot, not a letter difference. All of the recitation, wherever I go in the world, is always the same. It begins with the letter Ba in Arabic, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and it ends with the letter Sin, Min al Janati Wan Nas. From the beginning letter to the end letter, every single word, every sentence, every paragraph, Every letter is exactly the same. There isn't any difference. Now, if you understand what I just said, then you understand that it's by recitation, not by what's written down, and certainly not by what's being translated, that we understand Quran. Allah gives us some examples in the Quran, and I'll try to translate them for you. He tells us in the Quran that if you're in doubt about it, then bring a book like it. Well, it's been 1,400 years Nobody's been able to do that. He makes another challenge in telling us that you can bring 10 chapters like it. Go ahead and try. And of course, nobody's been able to do that. He even offers the challenge, bring even one surah, one chapter like it. And again, nobody's done so. The smallest chapter of the Quran is called Al-Kawthar. It's something like this. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna atina kawthar as small as this is this tiny surah yet in all these years nobody has been able to duplicate it or bring anything like it not in its depth of meaning understanding recitation or ease of memory 
Allah makes some other challenges in the Quran as well. He tells us in the Quran, have not the unbelievers seen? And he's talking now to the non-believers about the signs or proofs that he's going to give even on the farthest horizons and within themselves. So Allah is speaking now to who? To disbelievers and believers alike. He speaks to everyone with his book. And in his book, the Quran, the recitation, he tells us an amazing statement about the Quran itself. He tells us that it will be guidance for only some people, but not for everybody. He's telling us that only certain category of people will be properly guided and understand this book. In fact, that's how he begins the book. There are seven verses in the Quran when it starts out called Surah Al-Fatiha. They come something like this. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yawmuddin. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Idina siratul mustaqim. Siratul ladina an'amta 'alayhim ghayra al-maghdubi 'alayhim wa ladallin. In these seven verses, the praising and the exalting of Allah are the beginning. Establishing clearly that we worship Allah alone and turning to Him for guidance. And then we ask Allah for His guidance. Guide us to the straight path. The path of those who have the favor of Allah, but not the path of those that Allah is angry with, nor those who are lost or go astray. Immediately after this little seven verse prayer, Allah begins the very biggest of all of the chapters of the Quran called Surah Al-Baqarah. It goes something like this in the beginning. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Daliku kitabu la raybafi. Hudil lil muttaqin. Let's stop right there and take a look at the meaning. The meaning here is that this book that's being recited now is a book wherein there is no doubt. A source of guidance for those who have taqwa. What is taqwa? They're God-fearing and righteous. What does that also mean? It means there's another book out there somewhere that must have doubt in it. Additionally, the only ones going to be guided by this book are those who are going to be God-fearing. It has some other conditions too. Let's take a break and come back and explore those other conditions. You're watching Clearing the Fog, the Misconceptions of Islam. <laughs> Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. So is it logical to say all plastic surgeries are lawful in Islam to bring or to regain beauty? These very misleading questions need a very accurate and firm answers. Let us set up the rules and principles to cover all plastic surgeries in Islamic law. How Islam does legalize niqab or veil factor in our modern life? Is it fair to suggest that it is more cultural than it is Islamic? I would rather to answer these questions by just suggesting a very shocking fact about niqab. Are you ready for that? How Islam does legalize polygamy when Islam always says that respect natural instinct and natural feelings and knowing that not a single woman does accept anyone to share her in her kingdom. All what you have said is true. But is there any difference between your natural instinct and your natural desires, or maybe between your interest or what you wish to have, or maybe your interest and other interest. Is it true that anything came after the Prophet Sallallahu regarding this deen to be considered as a bid'ah, innovation? It's neither this nor that. It seems very well complicated and confusing to many Muslims. But especially what comes to the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Sayyidina Umar saying, Ni'matul bid'ah to have let us set up the very comprehensive definition of bid'ah according to Islamic law. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Lifting the Fog or clearing away the misconceptions that people have about Islam and what Islam teaches. We've been talking about the subject of the Quran and the Bible, and specifically we were talking about the verse in the Quran that tells us about who will be guided by the Quran. 
Now this verse starts out in the beginning of Surah Baqarah. Baqarah is the, fir uh, the first real chapter after the seven verse prayer. It's labeled number two, but it's understood to be the actual meat of the Quran, where it comes in. Now here it says, I want to mention something. This is a small point, but it's something worth noting. That the word here, Thalik, does not mean this. It means that. If you say this, you say Hadha. When you say Thalik, you mean that. So technically, there's already a mistranslation when we say, this is the book wherein there is no doubt. Actually, it means the book which is with Allah. There is no doubt in the book that's with Allah. And that makes sense. Both from the standpoint of the Muslim and those who follow scripture from before. There can be no mistake. There can be no doubt in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God's book. But what happens when people begin to try to write it down? And who will be guided by it? And Allah has told us about this. Very clear. When it says, Huda lil mutaqin, Huda here is talking about hidayah or guidance. Who are the people that are going to be guided? And Allah tells you, they are the ones who have taqwa, mutaqin. Remember what we said in some of our other programs. When you have a verb or action, when you put mu in front of it, that's the one who has it. Taqwa. Taki, mutaki, mutakiin. Those people having taqwa. What is taqwa? Taqwa is a piousness or righteousness in that they are God fearing. They're conscious of the fact that, you know, what I'm doing, God is watching. God is listening, and God knows about that. This is more or less the meaning of this word taqwa, God consciousness. In addition to that, Allah names some other characteristics of the person who's going to be rightly guided. He says that they are the people who believe in al-ghayb, which means the unseen. And this includes the paradise. We don't see the paradise. It also includes the hellfire. We don't see that either. It includes believing in Allah. We don't see Allah. We don't see the angels. All of these things are in the ghayb. And Muslims are to believe in that, according to the verse, when it says, and here Allah is telling us about believing, having iman, and that's why the word mu'min, having belief and faith in what? In the unseen. Even though you don't see it, you believe in it. These are some of the conditions we've spoken about in some of our other segments of this Lifting the Fog series. Additionally, they have to establish something called Salah. Now many times, this is another word we translate to English as prayer, but to the Christian or to the Jew, prayer means supplication. That's when you would put your hands like this, Oh God, oh God, I need this, I need that, and so and so. For the Muslim, we have that. When we raise our hands and we ask, this is called dua, not prayer. Dua. Then we have something else mentioned in the Bible that a person should pray unceasingly. This is in the New Testament. Muslims have that too. And this is called being God conscious in that you're remembering Allah, the remembrance of Allah, thinking about Allah. In Arabic though, this is called what? Adhkar, Allah, to remember Allah. This is also translated to English as prayer. But specifically, Salah is not prayer. In some of our other segments, we'll be dealing more about this. But to let you know, Salah is a ritualistic worship where the Muslim stands erect, facing the Qibla, with his hands placed specifically in front of him, and then he begins his recitation of Quran. He bows, stands, prostrates, sits, etc., following the way of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. All of this helps us to understand what is this thing called salah. The next thing it mentions here, he has to give from his rizq. The rizq or his daily bread, if you will, his wealth, the things that Allah has blessed him with, he will give that to the poor, to those who are less fortunate than he is. And he does so as an obligation, knowing that he has to do it. 
then these people also have to believe in what's being sent to you, O Muhammad. I'm continuing the verse. And they have to believe what was sent down before. That's already now in the very beginning of the Quran, reference to the previous revelations. Anzala, or what is sent down, what was sent down in public before you. And what is that? Of course, it's talking about what we today call the Bible or book. It was sent down. It was sent with Adam and it was sent with Abraham and Moses, Noah and David and Solomon and Jesus. Now, not all of them had actual books, physical books, but all of them had this same message of revelation coming and showing the people of what? That there is only one God. You have to worship him on his terms. And that's what this message is about. I want to continue now in this comparison between Quran and other revelation. As would be expected by a Christian that when the revelation of Jesus comes, the people who were before, such as the Jews, would be obliged to accept and understand that now the, last, uh, the next revelation has come and the last one before this is no longer in effect. Regardless of what you have that has survived, this now supplants that, replaces that, or abrogates it. Therefore, when Jesus came and spoke to his people and talked about revelation, what was ever before that is no longer valid unless he gave validity to it. Likewise, when Moses, peace be upon him, came, he did the same thing and he verified and confirmed the previous revelation which came from the, the prophets before Moses. Now, when we have Muhammad, peace be upon him, coming and he's reciting to us from Quran, and he's telling us this is the final and the last revelation and no revelation will come after this. It doesn't mean that it puts down the previous revelation. In fact, Muslims cannot be Muslims unless they accept all revelation as originally having come from God. But at the same time, it means that we have to know that when Allah supplants or abrogates previous revelation that's his right in fact that may be one of the tests that he's giving us as human beings so the Muslims do believe in all revelations but they believe in them in the context as they came but what's today doesn't represent that anymore just as if someone has a Bible in the English language and we'll say that's not the way it originally came we would say the same thing about the Quran if someone produced a Quran in English and said, here's the Quran in English, we'd say, no, it's not. This is not the meaning. Because Quran is recitation. So therefore, if you're saying it in another language, it's not the same recitation anymore. Let me give you another example. Just at the time of Jesus, he was telling his followers that they had to believe in the previous revelation, that there weren't going to be any new commandments and nothing is being canceled. We've mentioned that in some of our other programs. At the same time, though, he's telling them specifically what they're supposed to understand just in case they may have misunderstood something that came before or perhaps they weren't privy to that. They didn't know that. So he's clarifying it for them and showing them exactly, regardless of how you thought it was, this is how it is today. And so with that concept in mind, we can now look at the Quran in the same light that we would look at the previous revelation. It is coming clearly saying that yes, that came from God. Yes, you have to believe it. But no, it doesn't exist in its original format today. Therefore, you must accept what's in Quran if you're a true believer in the previous revelation. So it works both ways. A good Christian or a good Jew should be able to recognize these revelations were supplanted, abrogated by Allah. And they need to go with the most recent edition, if you will. And there is no edition of Quran coming after Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Allah said in the Quran that he is the Khatam and Anbiya. He's the seal of all of the prophets. And there's not going to be any prophet come after him. And when we listen to what he had to say, he clearly told the people that there would be no new revelation after him. And that the Quran is the final speech of Allah. So if we understand this, it becomes easier for us to realize that the Quran, the speech of Allah, the recitation, 
is with us presently, not in a written format, as much as it is in the hearts and the memories of the people today. We have learned the Quran from teachers who also learned it, from their teachers who learned it from their teachers, all of them reciting it from mouth to ear. And each who hears that then teaches the generation after them. So Quran is what you hear and recite. This is an amazing thing when you consider that nothing else can be passed down in tradition like this. If you took a room of 10 or 15 people and then ask each one to sit with you, you're going to tell them something and have them memorize it and then try to communicate this to the next person. Then they in turn will communicate it to the next one and to the next one, one by one. At the end, it wouldn't be the same message anymore, would it? It would change. Yet the Quran has never been changed. So this is something in Arabic called mu'ajza, or a miracle. It can't be, and yet it is. It exists today as it was recited at the time of Muhammad. Oh, and by the way, I should mention to you, he couldn't have copied something from the Bible, nor could he have made it up and written it down. You know why? Because Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was known as the illiterate prophet. He did not read, nor did he write. It would not have benefited him at all to have found some previous scrolls or previous books because he wouldn't be able to read it anyway. There are many narrations in the traditions of Muhammad explaining that whenever something had to be read, he would have to bring someone who would read it to him and tell him what it said. Even when he signed a document, he did so with a seal or khatam, which is on a ring. You press it down in the wax, just like the kings do when they press this seal. And that's the way he signed, because he didn't even write his name. So if you understand that he couldn't read, couldn't write, yet the Quran is an amazing thing in its recitation form, how could somebody come up with this, made it up on their own? The Quran is the recitation of Allah. It is the complete and final revelation from God Almighty to mankind. It confirms, verifies, and authenticates all the previous revelation. The final point is we as Muslims don't debate about the Bible being the Word of God. We know it was. We just know it doesn't exist in that format anymore. We also don't accept the Quran in translation either. So this is the meaning behind believing in the kutub or the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We hope we've been able to clear up some of the misconceptions with this edition of Lifting the Fog. Stay tuned for more. Ooh.